Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next session from Jewish soldiers to an Israeli. We have illustrious historians Anita Shapira and Derek Penslar in conversation to explore the connections between Jewish service in World War II and the formation of the Israel Defense Forces. During World War II, 30,000 Palestinian Jews served in the British Armed Forces, gaining experience that they then brought to the battlefield in Palestine. During Israel's War for Independence in 1948, the IDF was bolstered by thousands of overseas volunteers, including the commander of the, on the Jerusalem front, the American Colonel, Mickey Marcus. It is my pleasure to introduce Derek Penslar of Harvard University, and Derek will get the session started. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you, Michael. I take it everybody can see and hear me. Great. Uh, we're having some technical issues getting Anita on the, um, on the line, so I'm going to start. I want to start actually with, um, it's a story that begins the book I wrote about Jews in the military. It's very apropos of our, of our panel. Many years ago, I was giving a synagogue talk in Toronto, um, and I asked people in the audience who, uh, who had relatives who had fought in various wars. You know, there are synagogue audience, so it's, it's almost all Jews. And people talked about having relatives who fought in the Korean War, if they were Americans, or World War II, to be sure, or who had grandparents who fought in World War I. And, you know, the conversation went on. And then one man stood up in, in an unmistakably Israeli accent. He said that he had fought in the Har El Brigade in the 1948 war, and everyone in the room broke out into applause, which I found really interesting because people had just spoken about their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles, who had fought, perhaps quite illustriously, we don't know, uh, in various wars, including the Second World War, but there was a special um, valence, a special meaning attached to um, the Jews who had fought for Israel's creation. And what this conference is really all about is about restoring our understanding of the centrality of World War II in Jewish history, not only in terms of Jewish suffering, not only the suffering of the Holocaust, but Jews' uh, participation as soldiers um, and as fighters broadly understood. Uh, we saw this already from the very first panel with Leah Garrett and Deborah Dash Moore talking about the half million American Jewish soldiers and then the nice counterpart with Svi Gittleman and Oleg Bunitsky talking about the Jews in the Soviet Union, also about 500,000. Um, so this is what we're gonna be talking about today. And while I wait for Anita to come on the line, I'll introduce things a little bit. That um, the Jewish population of Palestine in 1939 was, was very small. It was about 500,000. So you think about it, there were as many Jews in all of Palestine as say American Jews or Soviet Jews who fought in World War II. It was a very small community. And um, it was a community in a state of danger, extremely vulnerable when the war began. Because after all, the Germans, um, through the uh, alliance with Vichy France, and through their own amazing military ability, the Germans had invaded North Africa. They were racing across the North African deserts uh, with major battles fought in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt. And during the first couple of years of the war, the leaders of what's called the Yishuv, Jewish community of Palestine, were quite worried that they might be overrun and that the Jews of Palestine would face um, fate, um, no no more merciful than that facing Jews in Europe. Now that made the situation then of Jews vis-a-vis -vis fighting in the war a bit, a bit dicey because on the one hand, do Jews in Palestine, let's say volunteer to fight for Britain and get sent off somewhere else, maybe they'd rather stay at home and fight to defend their own families and, 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 and their own towns and, and communities. So the idea of going to fight for the allied forces was actually quite quite a difficult, uh, a difficult choice to make in the early years of the war. Uh, but also at that time, I think people in uh, the Jews in Palestine weren't terribly happy with the British. After all, the uh, white paper of 1939 had been issued that effectively put an end to Britain's promises to create or to promote the establishment of uh, a Jewish national home in Palestine. The 1939 white paper uh, proclaimed that in 10 years time, uh, Palestine would become a quote, unitary state, which means an Arab dominated state. There were at least twice as many Arabs as there were Jews in Palestine. And that Jewish immigration over the following five years would be severely restricted. So there was 
tremendous anger uh, in the issue of the Zionist movement worldwide against Britain, which led the Zionist leader David Ben-Gurion to famously declare in the fall of 1939, we shall fight against the white paper as if there were no Hitler, but we shall fight against Hitler as if there were no white paper. Um, and this is the decision of David Ben-Gurion, but for the youth of uh, Jewish Palestine, it was a very difficult choice whether or not to, um, to volunteer. Uh, but volunteer they did, although volunteer might not quite be the right word. Um, one thing that the issue of leadership did is to find ways to try to publicly shame uh, young Jewish men who refused to volunteer, occasional outright coercion. Uh, one reason of uh, young men being dosed with uh, castor oil, that sort of thing, in order to, quote, encourage them to, uh, to enlist. Um, and, uh, and enlist they eventually did, uh, a total of about 30,000, uh, of whom I think about 10,000 or 9,000 actually stayed in Palestine, and the rest were, um, were sent abroad. But, the, you know, the broader question is, is not just about saving the issue from the Nazi onslaught. There was something much more at work than that, which David Ben-Gurion was aware of from really from the mid 1930s on when he saw that a war was going to be coming, which is that the, um, the fate of Palestine depended as much on the after war settlement as on what would happen uh, during the war. That is once the imminent threat to the issue was, um, was turned away, with the defeat uh, of the Germans at the battles of El Alamein a couple of years into the war, there still remained the question of what would happen after the war. It was a little bit like after World War I, where Jews are thinking about the, the, the peace conference, the peace agreement, and what sort of, um, what benefits might the Jews receive if they can demonstrate that they participated in the war on behalf of the Allies. So for Ben-Gurion, it was really very much a question of how to demonstrate to Britain and to the international community as a whole that the Jews were willing to do their bit uh, for the sake of Britain and the, um, and the British Empire. And this is why it was so important for Ben-Gurion, for Jews in Palestine to, um, to join the battle and to, um, and to fight. And this is an idea that came up very early in the war. As early as 1941, Ben-Gurion wrote up a document in which he wrote about uh, the need to establish a quote, Jewish army. So a uniformed, specifically Jewish division or force within uh, the allied forces, which is different from what happened with most of the Jews who served in the allied forces. They wore the British uniforms, they served whether it was in um, North Africa or they served in, um, uh, well, we'll talk about the Jewish brigade in just a moment, but many of them served in various parts of the uh, theaters of war. Uh, but what Ben-Gurion had in mind very early on in 1941 was a, quote, Jewish army. And uh, he wrote about this in much greater detail later in the war. And he, I don't know if he came up with the idea separately, but Chaim Weizmann, who was in some ways Ben-Gurion's closest ally and his closest rival, uh, Chaim Weizmann, who was the head of the Zionist movement in, in Europe, uh, he also had underscored early in the war, the need for a quote, Jewish army. And what's interesting is how long it took the British government to actually agree to the formation of a separate Jewish military unit. But it makes sense given the um, Britain's own highly, I would say at best ambivalent attitudes towards Zionism during, during the war, that anything that is done that helps bolster the Jewish claim on Palestine could hurt British strategic interests after the war when they're thinking of a post-colonial world in which they want to maintain close relationships as much as possible with newly independent or recently independent um, Arab states. So it took a while and it was really only after the, um, when the Germans occupied Hungary and uh, the allied military decided that this war is, you know, entering a kind of stage of, um, of, of a protracted denouement, this is going to take time that they agreed to the formation of the Jewish unit known as the Jewish Brigade, which is formed in 1944. And it wasn't that large. It was about 5,000 individuals, about the same size as the Jewish Legion that had been formed after or during World War I uh, by Vladimir Jabotinsky and uh, Josef Trumpeldor. But it had tremendous symbolic power. 
it, uh, its members fought in, uh, in Italy, in the liberation, the Allied liberation of Italy. They went to the Balkans, they fought in Yugoslavia. Many members of the Jewish Brigade wound up in France and they wound up um, in the vicinity of or made their way to um, uh, the Jewish communities in what would become the displaced persons camps after World War II. And they played a role in the ferrying or as it were the transportation through illegal means, the bricha, which was mentioned yesterday, of Jews from um, now freed Europe to, to Palestine. So the Jewish Brigade's significance goes way beyond a military significance, although it certainly had that. It was a political and psychological uh, significance as well. Now, one thing that the conference has stressed, and this came up yesterday in the panel where Evgeny Finkel was talking about Holocaust survivors and their own fighting for the state of Israel. And this is something he and I had a brief email exchange about, um, about later, is that, when we think about the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces in 1948, we have to understand that this is not a group of individuals who spring up um, on Palestinian soil and who have no connection with Europe. There's direct, immediate and constant connection between the Jews who are fighting for Palestine or in Palestine uh, and the European theater as a whole. First off, if you think of your typical IDF soldier early in World War II, let's say 1941, 42, 43. Uh, their parents are immigrants. They're immigrants from Poland, from somewhere in the Soviet Union, perhaps from Germany. Uh, the war is personal for them. This is something that is, is very real. Then we have the Jews who had immigrated, let's say in the 1930s. And this is something that I don't think was quite mentioned clearly enough yesterday who had actually served in the armies of the various successor states of East Central Europe, Jews who had served in the Czech military in the 1930s, Jews who had served in the Polish military. I think Javi Dreyfus mentioned this briefly yesterday. So there were Jews actually who had some military experience beforehand. Um, then there were older Jews like um, Yitzhak Sadeh, who uh, was a brigade commander in the 1948 war. His military experience in Palestine goes back to the mid 1930s. Um, and he had been in the Red Army. So you have Jews who had, in fact, military experience who are connected in one way or another with the 1948 war. One slightly amusing anecdote is of a much older German Jew who had been a World War I officer and who was too old by, obviously, by 1948 to fight, but who actually translated or helped translate German military manuals into Hebrew uh, and who would swear in Haganah recruits on his Prussian uh, eagle endorned uh, uh, German military sword. So there's a direct connection between Jews of European origin, Jews who had fought in Europe and the Jews in Palestine um, in World War II and, uh, and thereafter. But particularly there's the story of the Holocaust survivors, which is the source of enormous controversy. The IDF ballooned in numbers over the course of the 1948 war with 25 to 30,000 at the beginning of the war and almost 100,000 at the end. And by the end of the war, as I think Evgeny mentioned yesterday, something like 30% of, um, of the members of the IDF were in fact very recent arrivals from Europe. Professor Shapira has joined us. Hi. Good, good morning, good evening. How are you? Hi. How are you? Do you hear I'm, me? I'm well, I hear you very well. Um, okay. I've been providing some background information into the history of the um, Yishuv during World War II and the Nazi um, threat and the battles of El Alamein and the tough decisions about whether or not Jews should um, even enlist in the British Army. And I was actually uh, getting to the point of talking about 48 itself. And that's actually a very nice place for us to start um, uh, a conversation for me to ask you for your own. Uh, opinions, given how much you've worked on the subject, I can't think of anyone who knows it better than you do. Um, what about the the notion I was talking about? The notion that in 1948, that the IDF kind of sprang from nowhere, that these were sabras, native sons, you know, children of the soil of Eretz Israel, who pick up a gun and go off to fight, as opposed to the fact that so many of them had had some military experience in in Europe. 
Uh, and then in particular, the question of the Holocaust survivors and the story I was just about to relate, which is probably much more myth than reality of Holocaust survivors who have no military training whatsoever, who are shipped, I think, the, like, like sheep to the slaughter, right? And who were shipped off to, um, to battles, particularly the battles for Latrun. So anyway, I turn it over to you. Well, this is really a myth, but you know, how does a myth grow, a myth like that? Uh, in the battles of Latrun, first of all, there were at least four battles and the IDF failed to catch Latrun. Now, Latrun was the main fortress on the road to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was under siege. So Ben-Gurion was very strongly uh, demanding, no matter what, to take Latrun. Now, the result was a clash between the high command and Ben-Gurion, because the high command thought that Jerusalem can hold even without Latrun. And the seventh brigade that was formed at those very days, as I would say, the first real army brigade uh, that served in the IDF, uh, had only 10 days to organize or something like that. And the high command demanded more time. And Ben Gurion would not listen. He demanded to, to send the, the brigade to the fight immediately. Now, they failed, and there were more than 70 casualties in that special uh, battle. In the whole Latrun battles, there were around 170 casualties. Among them, there were maybe 10 casualties of newcomers. Hmm. So how come the legend? Now, the legend started because of the political clash between Ben-Gurion and the Palmach. The Palmach, the, the, uh, I would say, the most... Uh, well prepared unit in the army uh, was against the uh, Ben Gurion's uh, special attitude to the uh, to the uh, uh, veterans of the Jewish brigade. Now the seventh brigade was under the command of Shlomo Shamir, who was a major in the British army. Now, the whole thing, the, the, the failure to take Latrun, the, the fact that this reflected Ben-Gurion's insistence, and the fact that Ben-Gurion preferred the brigade veterans on the Palmach, this all uh, navigated the story of the survivor. How could Ben Gurion go into this battle? Uh, so the fact of the of the story that were clearly written by at least three specialists never uh, succeeded in. Uh, demolishing the meat. Uh, the fact was that many years later, after books were written on this subject, a Knesset member mentioned 2,000 Jewish casualties at Latrun. Now, just imagine the difference between facts and myths, and of course, the question of the Holocaust survivors was raised mainly by writers and by poets. And their fact and myth mixed together 
and the, the facts were not important. The important was the myth. So uh, the, the, actually, most of the important battles happened during the first month after independence, the second half of May and the beginning of June. At that time, the survivors did not arrive yet in great numbers to Israel, so they could not participate. Uh, for good for them, but this did not make the story uh, go away. This has a characteristic to stay on even if facts uh, are different. I think we all know that anyone living in the United States now and following political news or COVID news is aware of aware of that. Well, one thing that's great about this conference is that it is peeling away layers of myth. And you mentioned something that I want just now that I want to follow up on. You mentioned Ben-Gurion's preference for uh, Jewish fighters who had had experience in the Jewish brigade and yes. in general who had served in the British forces. And it's that connection between the Second World War in 1948, I'd like to ask you to comment on what was it that he wanted from these individuals? What did he see in them? First of all, Ben Gurion served in the First World War in the Jewish battalions in the British Army. And this was a formative experience for Ben Gurion. He always admired the British Army. Uh, now, he also admired the British people behavior during the Blitz. He was at, in London at that time, and he also admired Churchill. So for him, the British army was a model of a regular army that should be copied by the IDF. His first idea was to, mo to remobilize all the veterans of the Jewish Brigade and make them the, uh, the skeleton of the IDF. Thank God he did not succeed. But it goes without saying that there were officers and specialists that came from the British Army that had uh, uh, the knowledge that the IDF young IDF did not have and the main thing was the IDF at this early stage had no experience of big formations. It, it was still a militia and it had to turn overnight into a regular army with the discipline, with the usage of heavy weapons, and, you know, when Ben-Gurion in 46 told the military command of the Haganah that we will need planes and tanks and artillery, they looked one at the other and said, the old man got Gaga. So the, he looked for the British uh, officers to get from them the idea how to build a regular army. And it is true that he still did not have the means of establishing a, a regular army and they had to improvise. But the mixture of the two created uh, the IDF. Can you give maybe a concrete example of, I mean, I understand what Ben-Gurion wanted, but were there particular um, officers who had served in World War II, whether they were in the Jewish Brigade or not, who then wound up in positions of authority uh, in uh, the War of 1948, who maybe are examples of these, you know, of, of what it is that Ben-Gurion wanted these, um, these men to become? Well, I mentioned uh, Shamir, I think Chaim Laskov was another mm -hmm. one. 
Yeah. And there was the, the volunteer from the American army, uh, Marcus, Colonel Marcus, that Ben Gurion took a liking to him. And strangely enough, he also found a common language with the Palmach. And the result was that he became actually the commander in chief of the central uh, fighting zone on the way to, to Jerusalem. It was very unfortunate that he was killed by accident, but uh, this was a very good connection between Ben Gurion and the officers that get, got experience in Europe. You mentioned Marcus, who is something of a folk hero for American Jews. Uh, he's said to be, you know, the only, what is it, the, uh, the only figure, only officer who died fighting in a foreign war who was buried at West Point. And as I've argued recently in a book, well, of course he was buried at West Point. He was a graduate of West Point. And if you graduate, mm -hmm. you, 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 you get a burial there. Um, but I have gotten some pushback from uh, people in Israel who say, well, Marcus wasn't really all that important. He was more symbolic. And it reflected an Israeli need for recognition by foreign, quote, experts. Uh, but in real life, these people don't know anything. Uh, this is this is something this I've gotten is, from some Israelis. This is an exaggeration. And, you know, also the arrogance of Israeli officers. But the, the fact was that the real commanders were... Um, Egal Alon and its Hak Rabin. And, but the importance of Marcus as a, a intermediary between them and Ben Gurion was extremely important. And the fact that he was killed was very, very unfortunate. And you, you mentioned briefly the American volunteers, and I think there were even more from South Africa, uh, Canada. Uh, some from the UK. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about, because it wasn't that many, I think it was a few thousand, all Sachakol, and if you can talk a little bit about their particular contribution and how many of them actually were World War II veterans or were they too young to have fought in the war? I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'll say this. Some of them became skippers who brought the illegal immigration ships to Palestine. Some of them brought ships with immigrant with uh, weapons. Some of them were pilots. And they brought with them a professionalism that was lacking in the young IDF. And this is a fact. And uh, the fact that it took time for Israelis to recognize it it's because of what I call the Israeli arrogance. <laughs> no, which, with which I've never had any, uh, any encounters. The, <laughs> um, the, you, you mentioned Holocaust survivors coming a little late in the game. That is that the worst battles of the war were fought early. Yes. It reminds me also of something about the Machal and also about a diaspora assistance to Israel during the 1948 war, that a lot of World War II surplus material winds up in Israel, including aircraft. But they come late. They come rather late in the war, I think October of 1948. Yes. So there's something, something similar. See, this issue about myth versus reality, where we started and the, the power of myth. Um, I want to go back to something I mentioned briefly before you came on the line, which was about myth versus reality about the Jewish Brigade. That the Jewish Brigade is formed. We know that is actually there, you know, participating in the liberation of Italy. And they're in the Balkans. But how, again, do you compare the actual accomplishments, the military accomplishments of the Jewish Brigade with its stature in Israeli collective memory? I, I would say that its military uh, accomplishments are not very important, but it is extremely important in what it achieved in Europe after the war the encounter with the survivors, the uh, assistance to illegal immigrants to reach the, uh, the, the, uh, the seaboard, uh, the importance of 
um, revenge groups that came from the brigade. And last but not least, uh, some of them even got back to the uh, to Poland. And the fact that the Jew with a, a British uh, um, uniform and with the uh, Magen David on the shoulder appeared there. I, I, I must tell you the story that my school teacher told me many years after I finished school. He was from Krakow and he went to Palestine in 1938 to study in the university. And in the, he wanted to go to visit his parents in the summer of 39, but his parents swore to him, don't come if everything works out, we will come to you. But this was the last thing he heard from them. So he went to Krakow as a brigade member and some Jews came around him and cried, Mashiach hot gekumen, because they saw a Jews in a, a Jew in a military uh, uniform. This was extremely important to raise, you know, the feeling that the, the Jews still survive. Let's let's follow it up with one more question, and then we'll have a few minutes to. Um take some questions from the uh, from the attendees, which is about, again, about myth and memory, that to what extent the Second World War has a, a position in Israeli collective memory in our own day that is separate from that of the trauma of the catastrophe of the Shoah and the trauma, but also the um, euphoria of 1948. So it seems like these are the two foundational elements behind Israeli collective memory. But then there is the Second World War, the threat to the issue of early in the war, the 30,000 who served, Ben-Gurion's own strategic geopolitical vision that you referred to. To what extent does it have bearing, and this conference is largely about Jews from the former Soviet Union for whom World War II has enormous meaning in their collective memory. American so, Jews, less so. So I'll say, that until 1990, when the Russian Jews arrived in Israel, there was no remembrance of the Second World War in Israel, except uh, in connection to the Holocaust and to the, the danger before El Alamein. Uh, but after 1990, today, the Russian Jews celebrate V-Day in Europe. They have their medals and they have their kind of uh, get together and, uh, and mem mem tell memories and so on and so forth. So they brought with them the memory of the Second World War to Israel. It's interesting, and I think the Mahal also, there, there's a monument somewhere now in Israel to the Mahal that that's also become acknowledged in a way that it hadn't been before. I, I did not hear about that, but if there is a, a, a monument, it means that it's there. <laughs> that's right, that's right. No, it's just fascinating about how it really took, and it, it, it's, it's, it, it's very nice in terms of the major theme of this conference, which is, although it is about the Jewish experience of World War II broadly understood, it is largely about the Jews of the former Soviet Union. So I see that we have seven minutes left. And um, so I turn to our organizers to ask, how do we, how do we uh, field questions? Derek, you can pull any of the questions you'd like from the Q&A. Oh. oh, I see a whole lot. Oh, wow. And there okay, are well, we'll see many, that. so uh, okay. we won't okay, get to we'll all of them, folks? No. Okay. Oh, this is very <laughs> interesting question. Do you think a Jewish soldier had to wear any military uniform to be seen as Mashiach or just an IDF uniform? Could I it be think, a Soviet uniform? 
I think that the fact that it was in Magen David, which means that he is Jewish, this did not appear on Russian uniforms. So the, the, the important thing was that they could identify a, a soldier as a Jewish soldier under a Jewish symbol, which is important. There's also a question about military training given to Jewish soldiers by the British mandatory um, authorities. But I think that the question is actually referring to an earlier period. It might be referring yes. to the Great Revolt, yes. to the, the Arab Revolt of 1936. That's right. Okay, let's see here. Um, <laughs> I, I caught that too. There's a question. Why did Professor Shapira say, thank God Ben-Gurion did not succeed? You said that there was this vision that Ben-Gurion had of modeling the IDF entirely along the British forces. And you said, thank God he did not succeed. Why, why, but, why that? Well, because the, the IDF did not have the money and did not have the, the kind of tools that were needed by a regular army like the brigade. Now, the fact that the Haganah and the Palmach somehow managed to get organized very fast to the new situation against the, the invading Arab armies, regular armies, is thanks to their capability of improvisation, mm. of uh, initiative, of knowing the, the, the ground and making the British army again uh, in Palestine, in Israel, in young Israel would not work against the Arab countries. That's interesting. And I, I just want to follow up on that. To what extent do you think this was true then when after the war, because wasn't Laskov one of the first Ramat calls, wasn't he? Yes, he was after the Dayan. So to what extent this then, this tension between these different approaches to a modern military exists, or is it true that both Laskov and Dayan in their own way, I mean, Dayan very much tries to build up the IDF as a conventional modern army? Look, even before then, there was Iga Eliadin that was only a graduate of the Haganah. And Ben-Gurion once, when he was angry with, with a, a suggestion of him, <clears throat> told him, yes, I also read books. Namely, uh, you did not fight and I did not fight. So don't tell me what to do. But then after him, there was Maklev, who was a an officer in the uh, Jewish Brigade. But, you know, Maklev did not succeed very much. And actually, the, the big hero of the War of Independence was Igal, Igal Alon. What can I do? He was the best commander during the war, uh, and not anybody else. So. This fact shows that the, the need of a mixture between the professionalism of those who came from the British army and the initiative and the zest and daring of the people who grew up in the country and knew it better and knew the people. Final question. Um is, you know, I was talking earlier about the idea of a Jewish army and that Ben-Gurion's talking about that in 1941, Weizmann talks about it as well. Hannah Arendt had written about it, about the need for a Jewish army. And there's a question that points out many other people uh, discuss this concept of a Jewish army very early on. And um, can you speak a little bit more then about that concept and the relationship maybe between the grandeur of the concept and the reality of the Jewish brigade? The Jewish Brigade was created very late in the, in, the, in the war. It was supposed to, to make the Jews a, a, a 
a belligerent in the war so that they can come to the table of negotiation after the war as a par par partner to the uh, victory. But this is exactly why the British did not want to establish the brigade until 1944. And this is also the result why the brigade never had a real chance to show a military proficiency in the in the field, almost nothing. So its importance in history is more in the connection of what it did after the war, not what it did during the war. Uh, nevertheless, the fact that there were at least two, two or three uh, uh, high commanders of the IDF that came from the Jewish Brigade, it's important. Thank you so much. We are grateful to both Anita and Derek for this fascinating conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Bye.